<laughs> okay. Good morning. This is Lucy Riley with Ballots for Bernie, and I am here with my friend, Lulu Freisdat. Hi, Lulu. Hi, how are you? So happy to have you here with us. I'm really live pleased to streaming. be streaming. Yeah. So Lulu is an independent journalist and a documentary filmmaker. Um, Lulu's going to tell us a little bit about some of the projects she's worked on the past. in the past. She's going to give us some really interesting news that I know you'll want to stay tuned for um, about the um, Tim Canova race in Florida. Yes, Florida. It's always looming over us. It never leaves. Yikes. <laughs> so, Lulu, will you tell us a little bit about the um, film, that you, the documentary that you helped produce? Uh, I will. I produced and directed. The film is called Holler Back, Not Voting in an American Town, and it came out in 2008. Uh, what I did in that film was explore systemic problems with our elections that discourage participation. Right. And what I mean by that are built-in dysfunction that really holds people back. And I interviewed a lot of people who don't vote and don't participate in politics to find out what goes on with them. And then as they explained uh, you know, different reasons that they had for not voting, we would explore those in the film and look and see, is this really a legitimate problem? Is it something that needs to be addressed? And we would, in the film, we have about a dozen different reforms that we suggested in order to improve the election process. And one of the things that did come up was that people were concerned about whether or not the votes were being counted accurately. They just didn't trust the vote counts. And that actually, I think, has increased. So now there is a, a Pew Research poll out saying that about 50% of the voting population does not have confidence that their votes are going to be counted accurately. That is and tragic. It's very unfortunate. You can't really have a democracy with any kind of mandate right. unless you have the, com the voters' confidence that the people who are being elected are ac actually reflect the choice of the voters. And we really don't have that anymore. We've really... Um, We've gone a long way from that. And so what I did when I started hearing these concerns mm -hmm. was I started to investigate whether or not there were problems with the vote counts, and uh, in particular with the electronic voting equipment, because most of the votes that are counted in the country now mm -hmm. are counted on electronic voting equipment, right. starting in about 2000. So I went to Princeton, and I interviewed a team of graduate students, uh, two graduate students there, who hacked an electronic voting machine uh, it was the AccuVote TS, mm -hmm. and uh, it's still running in parts of the country now. And they had no problem getting in and installing a virus that would change the outcome of the election. And so we did a little practice election there. We, uh, there were three votes put in, and then we they printed out the totals, just like a normal election procedure, and you could see that the candidate that we voted for was not the one that actually was printed out on that the totals. That should terrify voters. Well, it's definitely a problem. What we want is for the people that we vote for to actually be printed out right. as the winners on the totals. And you can actually watch that clip from that from the film. If you go to hollerbackfilm.com uh, and click on film clips, mm -hmm. uh, the first clip there is the clip of uh, um, J. Alex Halderman uh, and his uh, colleague Ari Feldman hacking that machine. Uh, it's like a five-minute clip. I encourage you to watch it. It will definitely... If you have, <laughs> I don't know how you could watch it and not have concerns about the electronic voting equipment. And then what I've done since then is I've continued to research this issue. And then starting in about June of last year, uh, I w started working with statisticians to investigate what the statistical patterns are of our actual elections. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know... We've obviously shown that the machines can be hacked, right. right? That that potential exists. We know that there's an incentive right. to manipulate the vote because anybody who could control the outcome of election can control budgets, jobs, policy. Um, the route to power. <laughs> yeah, right. international relations. There's certainly an incentive to if someone could have control of the elections that they might want to. And in, if you look at what we call the fraud triangle, there's three points in the fraud triangle. One is opportunity. That means can right. it happen? We know that it can happen. One is incentive. We know there is incentive. And the third point on the triangle is rationalization, mm -hmm. meaning can people persuade themselves that this is an okay? Is this okay? Right. And we actually do have that also. We've seen in 
both political parties, the Democrat and the Republican Party, times when the party has crossed what, what are considered ethical boundaries right. in terms of manipulating the election. We saw that in the primary with mm -hmm. the uh, DNC, where they were supposed to be neutral, but mm -hmm. uh, as it turned out, they they did have their finger on the scale, and they were rooting for one candidate, sure, right? Yeah. So Because they so, know what's best for the American voter. Well, yeah. I think mm. any time that people cross ethical boundaries, they often have a rationalization. Mm -hmm. They often feel that it's okay. We saw there have been um, inside uh, reports, say, from the Republican Party, where uh, although publicly they say that the voter ID laws are just to prevent voter fraud, Privately or in testimony, Republicans have acknowledged that these laws were designed specifically to exclude people of color, for example. So, again, you have an ethical right. boundary which has been crossed um, and has – that we have – evidence that the ethical boundary has been crossed by one of the political parties. So certainly we do have clear evidence that there is rationalization sometimes to cross these boundaries. And the other thing to keep in mind is that we actually have a really long history mm -hmm. of election fraud. I've been reading a really interesting book by Tracy Campbell called Deliver the Vote. And he starts back in the 1700s, basically <laughs> from the beginning <laughs> of the, of right. the founding the cradle, of the country yeah, and charts yeah. election fraud over and over again and actually illustrates how election fraud has been really an ingrained part of the election process for hundreds of years. It's really been part of the, uh, the U.S. electoral mm -hmm. system. So to think now that we just don't have election fraud anymore doesn't really correspond with the historical trends right. where we have seen um, uh, there's certainly documentation about the election between JFK and Nixon that there was a, a good deal of election fraud there and uh, as I said Tracy Campbell has, has charted this throughout um, our nation's history so I was wondering is there some way that we can track this now sure. that we could try to figure out do we have uh, a problem with the accuracy of the counts and uh, there was a statistical pattern that uh, a statistical technique that had been developed by a group of analysts and I started to investigate it and see if it was accurate number one and number two if it had any meaning so what I did was the first thing was I had it uh, um, replicated mm -hmm. uh, I took that statistical pattern and I asked a statistical grad student at the University of California Berkeley uh, Kelly Ottoboni to and when was this this was starting in around June of 2015. Got it. Um, so a, about a little less than a year and a half ago. So I asked Kelly to replicate these graphs just to say were they accurate. And she did replicate them and she did confirm that they were accurate. And uh, let me, should I talk a little bit about the pattern? Please do. Okay. So this is what the pattern is. What we see in many of the elections now is a statistical pattern where as the votes go from a precinct with the smallest number of votes mm -hmm. to a precinct with the largest number of votes, we see one candidate getting an increase in their support and another candidate getting a decrease in their support. And we saw this in the 2016 primary in both races. Right. So we saw it in the Clinton-Sanders race mm -hmm. and we saw it in the Republican race. Mm -hmm. And it is fairly consistent which candidate is going up and which candidate is going down, although on the Republican side it varied more. Um, so in the, um, in the 2016 race, it was almost invariably Clinton's totals that were going up mm -hmm. as you got more and more votes, mm -hmm. uh, as, the, as you got into precincts with larger and larger votes, and it was always Sanders' totals that were going down as you got more and more votes. And the reason why this seems unusual is that there's a, there's a mathematical principle. Sure. It's called the law of large numbers. Mm -hmm. And what the law of large numbers tells us is that as a sample size grows, the average of the sample should come closer and closer to the average of the whole population. So 
as we and um, what we do with the votes is we add them together cumulatively. So you start with, uh, say, a precinct with three votes, sure. and then you add in the next precinct. Maybe the next precinct has six votes. Sure. So you add those together, you have nine, right? Mm -hmm. Now you have another precinct, and maybe it has 12 votes. Mm -hmm. So you add that precinct in, nine and 12 is what, 21. So now right. you have 21 votes. And then toward the end, you're adding in even larger precincts, maybe with 700 votes, right? So as you get further down. And as you get larger and larger um, numbers, what we would expect to happen is that you would move toward an average of that candidate's right. support. That's the same way where... That's this intuitive, is, yeah. It's not just intuitive, it's a mathematical principle. It was um, published in 1744 by Jacob Bernoulli, uh, and this is the basis of all polling. If you ask three of your friends what is their favorite movie, right. you might get, you know, a, a wide variety of answers. Sure. But if you start, but if you ask, you know, all of your friends, or if you ask a larger sample of all of your friends, say you ask 50% um, of all of your friends, sure. by the time you ask 50% of all your friends, you are going to get pretty close to the, to the average of what the, the majority of your friends think is their favorite movie. Right? Right. Uh, so, and after that point, you might ask 60% of your friends, 70% of your friends, but by that time, you've asked such a large percentage of your friends, you're going to, um, according to the law of large numbers, probably have figured out what is, like, the favorite movie of that group of people. Right. And so you should be able to predict. Uh, we would expect by the time that we have a, a large number of votes, and it depends on how many votes you're looking at. If you're looking at a county, so for example, if you're looking at Columbia County, which had about uh, 5,000 votes, um, by the time that county got to about 1,300 votes, each candidate had uh, hit about the average of what they were going to get, and then the, the this graphs is a flat line, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I, are we able to show some graphs? Or I think the best thing to do, if you want to see we'll go this, to you're going to go to my website. The website is electoralsystemincrisis.org. And at that website, if you want to look, for example, at the graphs of um, the Sanders-Clinton uh, race, you can check under Democratic primary graphs. And if you want to look at the graphs on the Republican side, you'll uh, just click on the graphs and go to Republicans. So, In fact, you can find um, a Lulu's website on the intro to the ballots for Bernie Livestream today as well. Great. So we saw, uh, as instead of those votes hitting an average percent of support, which is what you would expect once you get into th that large number. Sometimes you're talking about 300,000 votes. Instead, you would see, uh, for example, between Clinton and Sanders, you saw those uh, numbers going further and further on a slope. And these... Uh, and that is not what you would expect. It is not the statistically expected mm -hmm. pattern, no. So... These the difference we graphed the difference between the statistically expected pattern and what we were seeing, and it varied, but it would go as high as thirty six percent in Louisiana, um, and some of the others were more like eight ten percent difference. These are differences that were large enough to affect the outcome, uh, or to potentially affect the outcome. And just to remind our viewers at home, what is the statistical difference that we would consider um, inherent? as part of the formula um, that we really would not question that there has been um, any fraud. Um, we're looking at 5% or less. Um, there's we a don't variance. Have, this is different than an exit poll where you look at, you know, what the margin of error is. This is a statistically expected pattern. So unless there's some demographic reason, we would expect eventually for these numbers to hit an average. I mean, by the time you're getting to the end of the graph, we're charting these numbers along the x-axis, so we're adding them cumulat cumulatively together along the x-axis. By the time you get to the end of the x-axis, you've basically included all of the votes of that race. So you would expect to have an average. Sure. By the time... At that point, it's not just that you've asked half of your friends, it's that you've asked all of your friends, right? What and their in this favorite case, movie is. 300,000 friends, right? <laughs> right. You've That's asked, a lot of people. By the time yeah. you've added in all the votes together, you really have come to, you're looking at all of the votes, and it's quite surprising that we're not seeing an average of the votes at that point, but a number that has continued to go up and up or continued to go down and down. So, in the case of the Sanders Clinton race, 
on average, uh, the difference between what we saw and what the expected pattern was 12.82% or 13%. Which is alarming. Well, when you run the numbers on that, uh, this is how it breaks down. Um, Clinton was ahead of Sanders by about 3.7 million votes. If you take the 12.82 is basically is approximately 13%. If you take 13% of the total votes of the Democratic primary, you come up with about um, 3.4 million. That's close. So when you subtract that out, you come up with around 200,000. Sanders had about 130,000 votes in the um, caucuses. So if you subtract that out, now you're at about 70,000 votes that Clinton, that, that's taken a lead of 3.7 million and knocked it down to about 70,000 votes. Then if you look at some of the other irregularities in the election, for example, in Brooklyn, where you had 120,000 people knocked that off the rolls. Mysteriously lost their right to vote that day, right? That's yeah. in one, one county alone, in Brooklyn County, 120,000 votes. And all of those one voters... One county in the entire state of New York. Yeah. Right, and we had those irregularities in state after state across the country in this election. So you're talking about the irregularities in one county alone being enough to overcome that difference, potentially. Or um, So it is concerning. It does seem that these irregularities could be enough to have affected the outcome of the election. And we are not, this is not just in that race. We also saw irregularities on the Republican side. We actually saw, for example, in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Trump's vote decreased significantly between the smaller precincts and the largest precincts. Trump's vote went down by 17 percent. Which is even more than the Clinton-Sanders uh, race that we were just talking about. Yeah, so. Well, that was one state. What we, the 13 percent is on average, that was the 21 states that we look at, we looked at, we averaged it out, we averaged out the ones where we had, um, when we work, we usually have two analysts invest two analysts running the numbers separately, independently. They pull down the reports from the election websites. They uh, do the analysis separately, usually on different software. One of the analysts use R and one of the analysts uses Excel. And we compare those results and see if they're identical. And of the 21 states that we analyzed, we had about a dozen states where we had um, both of the results uh, we had enough time to have two analysts look at the results, and so we were very confident that those were accurate, and of those, we averaged them out, and that was the 13% that right, we got. Right, with that kind of redundancy in the system, you can expect what you've done to be um, the reliable. There yeah. is no question that it's accurate. We really have had the accuracy checked over and over again. The question is, what is the significance? What does it mean? Is there a demographic explanation for this? Is it an error? Mm -hmm. You know, is there some legitimate explanation for these differences we're seeing? So just to circle back to answer your question about Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, we saw a difference of 17% between Trump's totals in the smallest precincts and the largest precincts. That was in one state. That wasn't an average of all the states like we did on the Democratic side. The Republican race was considerably more complicated because there were so many more people in it. It was much right. harder to get an average of what we were seeing. But we were seeing consistent um, statistical patterns that were different than what one would expect on the Republican side also. In Ohio, for example, we saw John Kasich's totals go up as the precincts got larger and larger. Um, Trump, again, went down in Ohio. So there, there were several races where we saw Trump's results going down, and we did think he does have a reason to say, you know, that he's concerned about the outcome of the election. I think that's a legitimate concern. So again, the question is not whether or not this is happening. We know that it's happening. The question is, what is the significance? There are some demographic explanations mm -hmm. for this. So for example, in Louisiana, there is a large increase in the black population as you go from the smallest precincts to the largest precincts. There is a strong trend there. And because Clinton had more support in the mm -hmm. black community, that could explain So we would at expect least to see that in New Orleans. We would expect to see that in Baton Rouge, possibly Lafayette, which are urban centers that have far more African Americans than you might find in some of the smaller parishes that would be out away from these urban centers. Right, and in that sense, you could say, well, maybe there's a legitimate explanation for this. Right. Um, we did run the numbers on it, and we, the numbers don't look plausible to us. So for example, we looked at Washington Parish, mm -hmm. and in Washington Parish, the difference between the smallest precincts and the largest precincts in some points was almost 40%. Wow. 
So the question wow. is, and because Louisiana gives us a lot of demographic information, um, we know that there was 17% black turnout uh -huh. in that parish. So the question is, can you get 17%, can you take 17% black, black turnout if you have enough high enough concentration of um, people supporting Clinton in sure. that 17%, can you get to the 40% difference? We think it's highly implausible. You would have to have basically 100% of the black vote and maybe 25% of the white vote. Did she have 100% of the black vote? No, she didn't. There were actually a number of studies done that indicated that age mm -hmm. was the most important factor mm -hmm. in the race, in the election, mm -hmm. in the Sanders-Clinton yeah, election, yeah. and not race. Yeah. So many of the young black voters actually were leaning towards Sanders. Mm -hmm. So again, there is a trend there. One of the things that we're, but is it enough to explain the differences that we're seeing? We don't think so. And then you have to look all over the country. Is there a trend like that in Wisconsin? Does that trend explain the difference between Cruz and Trump in Wisconsin? That would seem even more implausible. It's, it, is, it is implausible. Is there a trend like that in Connecticut where we had a huge difference? In Staten Island, in Illinois, in Delaware? We had states all over the country that are showing this pattern. And that, I think, is one of the most persuasive arguments that this is not caused by demographics because the demographics where this is happening are so varied and yet the patterns are often similar. We see often 6% in one direction and 6% in another direction. 6% up, 6% down. We see this slope over and over again. Um, so the, explain something to me, yeah. Lubin. So the burden of proof to be able to compare um, and find out actually what the vote count is, that lies on the candidate a candidate has to call for the votes, for the ballots to actually be counted. Um, that can be a pretty um, expensive endeavor. But um, is what I'm hearing from you is that that is what's got to happen for us to be able to look at the ballots and see if, in fact, um, the, um, what was happening with the research that you're doing can be explained by these ballots actually being counted and uh, cast in that, in that manner in that way. Yeah, I really, I, I agree with you. I think it is, there's a couple things about that. It is an, a very heavy burden to place on candidates to, that they have to prove that, you know, whether or not their uh, election results are accurate. But that, unfortunately, is the system that we have right now. Right, because and, and what so, they've got to do is fight the stereotype of a sore loser, right? That, right? Yeah, that they're a sore loser, or that they're believing in a conspiracy theory. And what we... Well, there's a couple things. Number one, yes, in the situation that we're in now, we need for candidates to step forward and start contesting these results and asking for hand counts in order to... The, well, we don't have proof right now. What we have is concern. We have considerable... We have evidence that there are patterns that are concerning. You would call them a red flag. If we want evidence, we need to count the ballots by hand and compare that to the machine right. counts. So right now, the way to get that is for candidates to step forward and say, I'm concerned about this, and I would like a recount. Um, the next step is for us to start doing hand counts automatically, for us to have hand-counted paper ballots across the country. And it is so doable in most states. I know here in California, you do have large right. ballots. In and this, I was, In the city of San Francisco right now, right, we have 60... Uh, different things that you can vote for, candidates and measures right. in the city of San Francisco. Yeah, so that that's a heavy burden to try to hand count millions and millions of votes. But we want to hear your take on this. We think it's doable, and um, we really encourage you to try. And the first thing, so we're um, I'm working with Election Justice USA, and we're working with uh, Commissioner Virginia Martin, who mm -hmm. is the uh, election commissioner in Columbia County, mm -hmm. and they do hand-counted paper ballots there. That's in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, the New York ballot is smaller than the California ballot, but what she has said over and over again is that it is doable, it is affordable, and it increases confidence tremendously. And she's put together a template for election commissioners to take a look at, and um, one of the things that she said is that the first time you do it, it's tough. 
And so the first time a county tries to do a hand count, she says, probably don't try to do all the races, maybe do one. Right. But if you can select that one race that you're going to do 100% hand count randomly after the election, that will already significantly increase the confidence in the election and the um, mm -hmm. and you're uh, uh, you're actually really testing a, a much uh, it's a much stronger test if sure. you pick the if you pick the race randomly after the election right, right? what we understand not is that, that you choose the election you're going to hand count Prior, prior to the election, which right. is what we understand happened mm. in San Diego, right? Yeah, so that really defeats the purpose mm -hmm. of the audit if it's known ahead of time which race is going to be counted by hand. But what Virginia Martin said was the first time you do it, it's it's complicated. But she, they have um, active citizens who participate from the community. They get paid, I think, around fifteen dollars an hour. She said it's very affordable. It costs about one percent of their budget, and. Those people are trained, and by the time they've been through a couple elections, she said they know what they're doing. And she hires people with integrity, and that is something that obviously needs to happen. You hire people who do not have a, you know, a dog in the race. Right. Is that what they say? Right. So you, you want to hire people who are there to just get the accurate count. That's what right. you're going for. And the process right. is set up to ensure that. So the, the protocol for hand-counted paper ballots, and again, there's a clip of this on my website. If you go to hollerbackfilm.com, again, a clip on film clips, the second clip there from the film shows a hand-counted paper ballot, and you can see how it's done. There's four people on each ballot. Um, this is for a two-party system. If mm -hmm. you had three, three parties, obviously you'd, had to, you'd have to adapt this, or four parties if you have you know, more. But for a two-party system, you've got two people um, on, two people who are there, one person on one side, one person calls out the vote, mm -hmm. one person watches and makes sure the vote is called out accurately. Mm -hmm. On the other um, side of the table, maybe, or next to them, you have one person writing down the tally and another person sitting next to them making sure that the vote was written as correctly you as know was what? called. That sounds as foolproof and as dependable as we could probably ask for from ROVs around the country. Right? That is the standard mm -hmm. protocol for hand-counted paper ballots, and it's a great system, and it's used for, it's been used for years. It's been used in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and as I said, they're using it in, uh, you know, in Columbia County. And that is what my team is advocating for, and that's what Election Justice USA, I know, is advocating for across the country, hand-counted paper ballots, 100% mm -hmm. hand counts. That is the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And if we were counting the ballots by hand to begin with, we wouldn't be concerned about, you know, are the results accurate? We would mm -hmm. know. As long as there's other things, there, you can have fraud in a hand counted mm -hmm. election also. So there's a whole nother series of steps that have to happen. There has to be very careful chain of custody. The ballots have to be watched at all times, bipartisan. They have to be, in a, you know, bipartisan, watched by a bipartisan team. They have to be locked in rooms that um, two people have the key to, you know, that you can't get, right. they're called uh, double lock rooms, and uh, the audit has to be, the hand count has to be open to the scrutiny of the public and the right. media, video cameras, um, people have to be close enough to be able to be close enough to watch the ballots if that's what they want, and um, if you hear, Virginia Martin has talked about this a number of times, she just did a presentation at the Washington Statistical Society um, on a panel I was on, and she said their count is totally open to the public, to the media, scrutiny, whatever people want. They cannot touch the ballots, but they can look to the point where they're comfortable that the vote is being done correctly. And that is so important for people to have confidence. Right. There is so little confidence right now. So the solution, uh, as far as I'm concerned long term, is to move to hand-counted paper ballots. And in the meantime, yes, if we can get candidates coming forward, challenging these elections, and asking for recounts in targeted areas where we think we have concern. And I encourage candidates to fundraise ahead of time to pay for those recounts. Make that part of your campaign process. Fundraise for your campaign and fundraise um, enough to ask for the hand count after the election if you if there is concern. It should be something that we encourage candidates to do to build in the system as insurance. Absolutely. Just as you would not drive your car, your boat without insurance, just as hopefully, um, if you can afford it, you wouldn't be walking around without health insurance. Because if the worst were to happen, 
you need to be ensured that you can take the necessary steps to make sure that the election, every voter who voted for you, their ballot is counted as cast. Yeah, that's great. It is our most precious right as American citizens. And we have to value this process. We can't just drop our vote off um, at the ballot box and walk away. This election integrity movement demands your input. It demands you at home watching us today to step forward, to keep yourself abreast of these issues. We're here to educate. We want to agitate you to action. We want to demonstrate our concern with our legislators going and lobbying them for root for laws to 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 write laws we want to push these uh, bills to write bills we want to push these bills through our state houses through congress we need a system that ensures us that when we vote for a candidate we can trust that that ballot is going to be counted as cast Lulu, thank you so much for coming with um, and talking to us today. Now, I know all of our viewers are very interested um, in what happened in Florida. Could you talk to us a little bit about that race with Tim Canova? Yeah, I will definitely. And I love that um, analogy that you gave about health insurance and car insurance. Yeah. I think that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. Um, I, uh I love that. And in terms of demonstrating, I know that Election Justice USA is working with other election integrity groups across the country to uh, set up Democracy Tuesdays, which is every Tuesday there are going to be actions to um, move these things forward. And they are going to be demonstrating, if necessary, in different uh, state houses. Some in some of the states, it is actually illegal now to have hand-counted paper ballots because the legal way that the votes have to be counted is by machine. So we have to really do research, and they are in the process of doing that research, right. finding out which states um, it's legal to get hand-counted paper ballots, where it's not legal to move that legislation forward, as you said. And in terms of getting involved, like what you said, one of the great things about hand-counted paper ballots is that it does bring more people into the process. Sure. You get in there, and you get involved, and you have yeah. confidence because you're there watching and participating yeah. and doing the count yourself. So yeah. absolutely get involved, contact your election commissioner, find out how your votes are counted and m move the process forward and get, and get in there and count the votes yourself. That's I love that. Yeah. So in terms of what happened uh, in the race in Florida. So this is Florida's congressional 23rd district. Mm -hmm. It was a primary. It happened on August 30th. And you had Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz who is the incumbent candidate running against Tim Canova, who was a challenger. And uh, there was a, the race got a good amount of publicity. Mm -hmm. I think many people are aware that Debbie Wasserman Schultz was forced to step down as right. the chairwoman of the Democrat Democratic National Committee um, regarding what I spoke about previously, that there was uh, some bias there in sure. the DNC, and she was held responsible for that. So her race got a good deal of, of coverage. The question is, was it an accurate race? She won the race. She won the race by about 13%. We did, the, we did the statistical analysis for this, and there, uh, these results actually are up on our website too now, although I haven't um, fully, ex I haven't, uh, I'm going to put up a blog explaining them more fully, but that the actual graphs are there on the website. If you click on graphs uh, and look at Florida's 23rd, you can pull these up. We did see the same pattern that we're seeing all over the country in this race, and it is concerning. So what we saw is that in the smallest precincts, the race was actually very tight. Mm -hmm. And as you moved into the larger, as you basically as you get a larger and larger accumulation of the votes, so you're adding in larger and larger um, pre, uh, you're adding in precincts with larger and larger numbers right. of them, right? And as you move into those precincts with larger numbers of votes you got a wider and wider spread between the candidates. And it has a, a mathematical precision to it, this line. Wasserman Schultz goes up by approximately 6%. Canova goes down by um, approximately that amount. Uh, it's a little less than that because the spread between them, between the largest precincts and the smallest precincts, is about 10%. Mm -hmm. So was it enough to change the outcome of the election? We're not sure because she won by 13%. And the difference between the expected statistical pattern and what we actually saw was 13%. Mm -hmm. But do we think the pattern is unusual? Is it statistically unexpected? Sure. Yes, it is. Now, is there a demographic explanation for it? We spent a lot of time looking at the demographics. And in Florida, they did give us a good amount of demographic um, yeah. data. So there is an increase 
between the smallest and the largest precincts in the black community, similar to what we saw in Louisiana. Is it enough to explain this increase that Wasserman Schultz had? We do not think it was enough. The, the increase from the smallest precincts to the largest precincts in the black community was around 4%. The increase in uh, Schultz's total was about 6%. And there was really no other demographic group that went up. The Hispanic vote actually went down. Mm -hmm. And so if you combine the Hispanic vote and the black vote, actually, between the smallest and the largest precincts, they actually kind of cancel each other out. So there does not look to be a large enough demographic trend to explain why uh, Wasserman Schultz's vote is going up so much between the smallest precincts and the largest mm -hmm. precincts. And again, this is not what we expect because by the time we have such a large accumulation of votes, we would expect her, her percentage to have leveled off, not to mm -hmm. continually go up and up and up. Um, we did another thing there in that race that was very interesting. We did what we called, we de-engineered the results. This is Explain a very that to us. strange idea, but mm -hmm. one of the possibilities about what's happening is that it, there's research that's been done now by um, Bev Harris at Black Box Voting that it's possible to actually track an individual vote in the machine with a barcode, basically. Does that make sense? So you basically watch it go through the entire process. Of not us, mm -hmm. not us mm -hmm. watching it. Mm -hmm. The machine itself is able to track a particular voter with a barcode. But so you should be able to see what the machine has tracked, right? There should be some sort of ticket, something. You actually don't want the machine to be mm -hmm. able to track individual mm -hmm. voters. Mm -hmm. I haven't talked with you about this, but mm -hmm. you would want a vote to be anonymous. Got it. If the Got machine it. can track an individual voter with a barcode, then a machine can also track a whole demographic trend with a barcode mm. because mm. we know the demographic makeups of these neighborhoods and we know often how these demographics are voting or how they're leaning. So if you took particular segments of the population and you magnified their vote by a certain percentage and you decreased other votes by a certain percentage, you might be able to affect the results by magnifying certain trends and okay, decreasing other trends. Does that make sense? I think I understand. Folks at home that are viewing, if you have any questions about um, the statistical analyses that um, Lulu's talking about, please send us your questions. I know that she would love to break that down for you. We need to be able to understand what's happening in our elections. When there are variances that um, cause election integrity um, experts um, uh, to furrow their brow, uh, we should be able to talk with them to understand what's going on. This is an educational process that we're offering here on Ballots for Bernie. Send us your questions. Lulu, please, go, for, go ahead. So uh, when I talk about this de-engineering, what we did was we took Debbie Wasserman Schultz votes and we divided them by 2.5, and we took Tim Canova's results and we multiplied them by 2.5. Mm -hmm. And when we graphed that, we got a very flat line, straight, what you normally would expect. And the results were very different. In that, in, with those results, um, Canova had a sizable lead. Wow. Now, am I saying that that is what happened? Mm -hmm. Do I think that one candidate's votes were multiplied in the machine by a certain number and, can, and the other candidate's votes were divided by a certain number? I can't say for sure. I think there is a possibility that that is what's happening. And it yeah. concerns me that you could take election results and divide them by a single multiplier and get a straight flat line. That yeah. is odd. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that this weekend. Um, John Brakey from Arizona is going to talk to us about fractionalized votes or vote fractions. Um, we want you to oh, tune in. Yeah, great. this weekend um, we'll be live streaming our ballots uh, for Bernie um, with a large number of uh, election integrity um, organizations across the country under the California Election Integrity Coalition. 
and we've invited uh, Election Ju Justice USA, a um, number of other groups uh, that are going to be sending speakers. Um, this weekend in Richmond, California at Grace Luther Lutheran Church. We invite you, if you're in the area, to come out and join us at the conference Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. And um, we've got great lunch for you. We've got <laughs> breakfast, and uh, we've got a social hour um, Saturday afternoon. Just a little plug for our conference there. So, Lulu, please tell us more about um, the election in, um, in Florida and some of the irregularities that you saw. Um, and also in terms of that conference that you're having, I know that Paul Thomas from Election right. Justice USA is going to be there. Is he at 4 p.m.? on Close, the, close. Okay, mm -hmm. on uh, which day? So that's going to be on Sunday. Right, and that's mm -hmm. going to be talking about hand-counted paper ballots, right. which is what we're really supporting. And I think Kelly Mordecai might be on that um, panel also talking right. about a process that he's doing with us. Uh, right, that should start juries. at 345, but as in most conferences, our timetable is in flux and could change. <laughs> Um, but it'll be tomorrow. It will be Sunday afternoon. Did you post the schedule? Is there a schedule? We do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing that myself. Okay. Um, so, do we have questions? Because I think I've pretty much given you my overall, like, to you know, recap in terms of what happened in the Canova Wasserman Schultz race. We did see the pattern that we've seen all the, all over the country. We do consider it concerning. We saw a 10% difference between the expected statistical pattern and the actual results. The pattern did favor Wasserman Schultz. We did not find a demographic trend that would um, explain the pattern. We don't think it's an error because we saw the pattern over and over. We saw the exact same pattern in Broward County, in Miami-Dade County, uh, in precinct after precinct. So that's not an error. An error is something that goes in one direction one time, in another direction another time. It's random. Sure. Might favor one candidate in one race, another candidate, you know, at another time. Mm -hmm. So the, the results uh, are too consistent to be errors, mm -hmm. and they seem too precise also. As I said, when we de-engineered this pattern, we got a straight line. That seems, so the pattern has a mathematical precision to it, which concerns us and does indicate the potential that there is some kind of manipulation involved in these results. Right, because we'd actually expect different counties to have different, different outcomes. We wouldn't expect this same formula to be across the board in, in Florida, right? Yeah, I mean, different counties have different demographic makeups. To see the exact same statistical pattern in Miami-Dade County and in Broward County is very unusual. Right, which we've got two entirely different um, demographics, um, they're not, age groups. Yeah, um, yeah they're not yeah. entirely different. Mm -hmm. I think Miami-Dade does have a slightly higher Jewish um, mm -hmm. population, which I think would favor mm -hmm. Wasserman Schultz. She did do a little better there. That did not surprise me. But that the statistical pattern itself was basically identical, highly concerning. Highly concerning. So, you know, um, I am in, I've got a question for you. So I'm interested to hear more about what happened in Louisiana because Louisiana seemed um, in your, um, in, your dis in, the, in our discussion to be um, more red flags showed up in Louisiana than possibly any other state outside of, outside of New York maybe. Um, there were flags all over the country. So you know what? Let's talk about some other states too. To say, I mean, we've I will got say, people yeah, looking in yeah. from all over the country, and we want them to be alerted that this could have happened in your state as well. Uh, we'll be talking about civil grand juries um, this uh, weekend at the Election Integrity Conference. Take back the vote as well. Um, there is absolutely uh, there are absolutely steps that you can take in your state. Um, to move uh, transparency in your elections process forward, and we'll be talking about that. But, yeah, talk to us about some other states. Um, I, well, one more thing I will add about Louisiana before we move on is um, there were a lot of independent candidates say, in the race on the Democratic side. Besi besides Sanders and Clinton, there was, like, Rocky de la Fuente and a whole slew of other candidates. And we did see their results also go down drastically right. between the small precincts and the large precincts. And we just cannot find an explanation for that. They're all in sync, all going straight down as Hillary Clinton's totals are going up. Which so makes no sense. It's odd. It's definitely, as I said, it's concerning. So other places where we saw these patterns, in Staten Island, uh, there was 
a complete reversal of the results. Sanders started out ahead in the small precincts, and by you, the time you got into the large precincts, the graph is basically like an X. This is Sanders going down. This is sure. Clinton going up in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. Illinois had the same kind of pattern. Huge. Cost. I was one. Of, I was one so, of those people that was watching the election results come in with um, you know numerous other people in the same um, business of the same restaurant, and we were aghast to see these numbers drop so far for Bernie. Yeah, it was it was very concerning. Now, when we look at hand-counted counties, we have not found any hand-counted counties that have this pattern. So in Columbia County, they had what we call a very expected statistical pattern. You had a little bit of fluctuation in the small precincts, and as you got, as I said, to about 1,300 votes, the, the candidates really settled in to an average. Mm -hmm. It was the same with the hand-counted precincts in Wisconsin. We saw a very um, stable percentage being achieved. And as we look back into older races, in general, um, we have found, like when we looked at 2000 and 2004 races in Florida, those also had an expected statistical pattern. We saw basically the candidates hit an average and just stay there. So it does seem to be a pattern that for some reason is becoming more and more prevalent. Mm -hmm. You know, again, we cannot say for sure why this is happening, but it is... It, we, and we can't say for sure because we can't count the ballots. If we, could, if we could count the ballots by hand, we wouldn't have to do all this statistical analysis. I mean, I think we would still do it just to, you know, have confidence. It's always good. There should be multiple redundancies. So we right. should be doing the polls ahead of time. We should be doing the exit polls afterwards. We should be doing statistical analysis. And we should be counting the ballots by hand. And right now what we have is a system where these redundancies, as they exist, are contradicting each other, mm -hmm. right? The exit polls are different from the counts, are different from the the statistical results. So what that tells us is that there's something askew, right? What you want is a system where your polls ahead of time are in agreement with your results, which are in agreement with your exit polls, which are in agreement with your statistical analysis, and then you have confidence, right? That is not the system we You've have You've got now. four layers of redundancy there, right? That's yeah. something and you that want you them trust. to be in sync. Right now, these, these um, different checks that we have on the system right now are all basically giving us red flags. Right. And that's what we really want to pay attention to. We've got a lot of red flags here. So um, other states that we saw uh, problems in, uh, many of the southern states, Tennessee, Alabama. Okay, I can talk about the demographics in Alabama because there's sure. a really interesting case in Jefferson County, Alabama, again, to contradict the demographic argument. In Jefferson County, Alabama, this is an article that uh, Doug um, Doug. Hatlam Johnson put up on Counterpunch, and I went back and reread it the other day. It's a little bit, it's a, it's a little um, hard to follow, but I realized he had a very persuasive argument. You saw a huge gap there in Jefferson County between the smallest precincts and the largest precincts. It was almost 50%. Wow. And what Doug pointed out is that in that county, the black vote, because in Alabama most of the Democrats are black, and most of the Republicans are white, in Jefferson County, Alabama, about 90% of the Democratic vote is actually black. Mm -hmm. So if the vote is almost all black to begin with, then you don't have a demographic explanation that it is the black vote sure. that is causing this increase from the smallest precincts to the largest precincts because all of the precincts are pretty much black and far as, as far as the Democratic vote goes. So again, there we have a situation where you have a pattern, it's defying the statistical um, expectations, and we do not see a plausible demographic explanation for it. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's, it's alarming. Um, you know, I can imagine that the folks that are going to be watching this live stream on their lunch hour um, mm -hmm. are, you know, going to spew coffee across the room. <laughs> this is what so many of us know um, intuitively happened um, in this primary. Um, no matter what side of the political aisle we're on, we're on, we know that shenanigans happened. It's not the first time. We saw it happen in 2000. We had saw it happen in 2004. Folks, we want to invite you to become an election integrity activist. What that means is you've got to educate yourself. We're here to help you with that process. We are here to encourage you to read, to um, come out and do actions with us all over the country, um, to be part of social media actions um, that bring awareness um, to people who may not be aware that there are shenanigans that are happening in our elections. 
Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of people in this country that still believe in the process um, that are showing up to vote but do nothing after they cast their ballot. Um, in the 2008 election, excuse me, 2012 election, we had 51 million people show up to vote. Um, in the 2000, 2012 election, we had 51 million people show up to vote. Um, that was probably one of the lower um, presidential uh, election uh, voter turnouts that we've had in quite some time. In 2014, we had 34% of registered voters come out to vote in the midterm elections. That is abysmal. We appreciate you if you are coming out to vote. The problem is that the majority of Americans are not. In this primary, we only had 9% of registered Democrats come out to vote. Folks, we've got to be more a part of the process if we want to change the trajectory that we're going on in this country. We invite you to join us on our weekly live streams here at Ballots for Bernie. We want to thank Lulu um, of Prizdat for being our guest today. Um, we want to invite you to come out to our uh, Election Integrity Conference, Take Back the Vote, if you're in the Bay Area, which is going to be at Grace Lutheran Church in Richmond, California, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., both Saturday and Sunday. And folks, we want to encourage you to uh, go on to the Election Justice USA. That's EJUSA.com website. That, it's not EJUSA, actually. It's... um. It's electionjusticeusa.org. Got it. Okay, got it. So um, we there's also an EJUSA uh, Facebook page as well, right? It's If you look for election justice, and election justice has basically moved to MeWe. So uh, there's a lot of tracking and blocking going on on Facebook that they're very concerned about. We all and are, And so yeah. you can go to the um, Election Justice USA Facebook page on Facebook. Just search for that. And then there on their Facebook page, they have a link to the MeWe page. And it just takes about three minutes to sign up on MeWe. It's really fast. And they're a lot more confident that the messages that you're sending on MeWe are not being tracked or blocked in some way and that people can communicate each other and be more comfortable about it. So um, definitely uh, I encourage people to uh, join Election Justice USA uh, with the Democracy Tuesday demonstrations and uh, they're having live streams also mm -hmm. every Tuesday um, and whatever election integrity group you want to join, join one. I totally agree As with As if Lucy. you could be a part of enough, right? Well, We want just, you to join them all. <laughs> I, the, no, this is what I want to say about this, is that this is ground zero. This is the issue that affects all the other issues. So I think it's great if you're going to go, and, go out and vote, but if you go out and vote and your vote is not counted accurately, in a way, you've wasted your time. It's really unfortunate to say that. But that really is the possibility here. So if you want to make sure that your vote is counted accurately, unfortunately right now you need to do more. We all need to get involved. And this is the issue that we have to solve before any community can take, make progress on its other issues. And this is not something that is just for progressives, Democrats. This is an issue that affects everyone. I'm nonpartisan. I, we look at the statistical analysis of many parties. Um, and this is something that affects libertarians, Republicans, Democrats, Greens. Everybody is affected by whether or not the votes are counted accurately. Everyone who has integrity will want the votes to be counted accurately. So this is a process that we encourage everybody to get involved in. And right now, it's the most important process in terms of our political process because all other issues are affected by whether or not the votes are counted accurately and whether or not the people who get in office and make these policy decisions for us are actually the people that have been chosen by you, the voter. Lulu, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, and you can follow me at Lulu Breistat on Twitter. And yes, you can, and please do. Please do. And you can read the full report, electoralsystemincrisis.org. And if you want to help fund this research, there is a PayPal link there. Feel free to help. Absolutely, folks, because this work does not happen uh, in a vacuum, right? Um, we need to support our election integrity activists. Um, they uh, cannot pay their bills without your help. So please come on in, get on that uh, PayPal, send Lulu five bucks on uh, on this Friday, five buck Friday, right? Yeah, sure. 
Yeah. That would help. So yeah. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in to uh, Ballots for Bernie live stream. Folks, we can run progressives till the cows come home, but we will never get our candidates into office until we clean up this elections pro process. We need transparency in the system. Lulu, thanks again so much. We hope that the next time you're here in the Bay Area, you'll come on out and uh, let us interview you again. I would love to, and I hope next time I come, we'll have more confidence that the votes are being counted accurately. High five on that, sister. <laughs> All right. Okay, All right, folks.